Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. Yeah, we love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for January 10th through 16th, 2022. This is covering Genesis chapters 3 and 4 and Moses chapters 4 and 5. And now, let's bring out the star of the show, the scriptures. I can't wait to see what we're going to learn today. They look so shiny and new. And now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 28 minutes, 43 seconds. That's very easy. And what would it be daily? Four minutes, six seconds. Easy to do. You can take a look at time codes here if you want to follow along chapter by chapter. Otherwise, buckle up and we'll talk about it all together. We've got a couple quick notes here. If you haven't seen them yet, check out our video on the history of the English Bible. It's called How We Got the Bible, Ancient Manuscripts to the King James Version. You will never look at the Bible the same way again. Also, We put together a short video to have some fun with Hebrew through song. This is a great activity for kids of all ages. Include a taste of Hebrew into your scripture study with song. You'll be glad you did. It's a lot of fun. Now, last week, the earth was created. It makes me feel like I was born yesterday. (laughs) And Adam and Eve were in the garden eastward in Eden. The book of Moses... Now, remember, this is the Joseph Smith translation of the early portions of Genesis. This gives us additional information about Lucifer in the first four verses. Remember that in the Moses and Genesis account of the beginning of this world, Moses is seeing this in vision. So let's take a look at Moses chapter 4, starting in verse 1. And I, the Lord God, spake unto Moses, saying, That Satan whom thou hast commanded in the name of mine only begotten. Now you might remember this is in reference to Moses chapter 1 when Moses commanded Satan in the name of Jesus Christ to depart. Right. So that Satan is the same which was from the beginning. And he came before me saying, Behold, here am I. Send me. I will be thy son. And I will redeem all mankind, that one soul shall not be lost, and surely I will do it. Wherefore, give me thine honor. Now look how many times Satan uses the words I or me. Six times. Now let's look at the Savior's response and count how many times he says I or me. Verse 2, But behold, My beloved Son, which was my beloved and chosen from the beginning, said unto me, Father, thy will be done, and the glory be thine forever. Okay, so counting, we get none. He never says, I or me at all. Verse 3, Wherefore, because that Satan rebelled against me and sought to destroy the agency of man, which I, the Lord God, had given him, and also that I should give unto him mine own power. By the power of mine only begotten, I caused that he should be cast down. And he became Satan, yea, even the devil, the father of all lies, to deceive and to blind men and to lead them captive at his will, even as many as would not hearken unto my voice. I find that interesting, that there are two moral influences listed in verse 4. There's no neutral ground. Whatever influences us will have moral consequences on one side or the other. We're either listening to Satan's voice or we're listening to our Heavenly Father's. So in verses 5 through 11, the Lord referred to Satan symbolically as a serpent and taught that Satan sought to destroy the world by tempting Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. That's in verse 6. In verse 7, it says, And he said unto the woman, now let me just take a break a second there, isn't that interesting? In this vision, Satan speaks to the woman. In Old Testament poetry, wisdom is female. That's given throughout the book of Proverbs. And so is folly. Woman is also identified with the home. 
and she is the most powerful influence on her children's beliefs and values, which is why later there will be such a strong importance placed on marrying a woman in the covenant of Israel, for otherwise she would lead the man and the children away from God. It seems Satan recognizes that to destroy the world, he must first destroy the family, and so his focus is on the woman. Also, I find it interesting that the first conversation recorded involves the woman. I don't know if you've ever tried to get a conversation going with some teenage boy and you just get monosyllabic answers. Women dominate in the verbal realm from the youngest age. For example, at 16 months, girls have a vocabulary of 95 words, while boys, on average, have a vocabulary of 25 words. And women dominate in careers that capitalize on that gift, from teachers to therapists to writers. So it's interesting that the first conversation is happening with the woman. Let's go on in verse 7. Yea, hath God said, and this is Satan, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And he spake by the mouth of the serpent. Now notice right away, he's twisting the truth. In other words, didn't God say that you can't eat of every tree of the garden? Well, she comes right back in verse 8. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. So she sees his lie. She declares the truth. And then in verse 9, But of the fruit of the tree which thou beholdest in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. It's interesting that in verse 8 and 9, Eve almost gives a patronizing answer to Satan, where she first corrects him, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but then calls out the forbidden tree, which thou beholdest. So in other words, that tree right there, are you looking? Are you seeing? That's the one we've been told not to do. And it's funny. She seems to want to spell it out for him. Yeah. Let's back up to the commandments that God had given. We talked about that in our last lesson. This is Moses chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And I, the Lord God, commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil... Thou shalt not eat of it. Nevertheless, thou mayest choose for thyself, for it is given unto thee. But remember that I forbid it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. But then also, in Moses chapter 2, verse 28, And I, God, blessed them, and said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. So what's the problem? Lehi in the Book of Mormon fills us in. This is 2 Nephi chapter 2, starting in verse 22. And now behold, if Adam had not transgressed, he would not have fallen, but he would have remained in the Garden of Eden, and all things which were created must have remained in the same state in which they were after they were created. And they must have remained forever and had no end, and they would have had no children. Wherefore, they would have remained in a state of innocence, having no joy, for they knew no misery, doing no good, for they knew no sin. Now, notice that the tree is called the knowledge of good and evil. This might be something called a merism. It's a literary device in which one takes two opposites, such as good and evil, and combines them to express the totality of something. In this case, perhaps the totality of all knowledge. You may have seen this in other places in the scriptures. For example, we see things like black and white and bond and free, righteous and wicked. But also Jesus Christ describes himself as the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end. See, the idea of those two extremes includes everything in the middle. So that might be true here as well, the idea of gaining knowledge. So, there are many ways we can look at what's happening right here. One is to observe that there's a choice now to be made between two commandments. 
Does that ever happen? Do we ever find ourselves needing to choose between two conflicting commandments? And I cautiously use the word conflicting. Your little sister, let's say, has come out of the bathroom, trying on makeup for the first time, and she looks like Bozo the Clown. (laughs) Kids, ask your grandparents. You get the idea, though. So let's say, for example, that we take two commandments that might seem to be in conflict, or maybe they really are. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4. From verse 25, it says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor. But then in verse 32, it says, And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted. Well, in this situation, do we emphasize honesty or kindness? And maybe there's a way both of those things can work. But I would propose that the more kind you are in this situation, the more you might not be fully honest. And if you're fully honest, it may not seem kind. So your mind might already be rationalizing how to obey both. But I use this simply as an example to consider that whichever commandment we emphasize says a lot about who we want to become. And so it may be with Eve. Going back to this perceived conflict, we have this quote from President Joseph Fielding Smith. This is from the Doctrines of the Gospel Student Institute Manual. He says, quote, Now this is the way I interpret that. The Lord said to Adam, Here is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you want to stay here, then you cannot eat of that fruit. If you want to stay here, then I forbid you to eat it. But you may act for yourself. You may eat of it if you want to. And if you eat it, you will die. End quote. So as we go on with this, consider how much this pattern will be like what we will see later in the Old Testament stories, where they're about to begin a journey, a journey into the wilderness. And that will be a place where they will be learning and preparing to come to God. So keep that theme in mind as we go on in verse 12. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it became pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make her wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and also gave unto her husband with her and he did eat. Did you notice Eve's motivation? Wisdom. And where was Adam in this account? He was with her. Now, if I could take just a side note to discuss one of the ways that I've grown to visualize this event, and I just offer it as my take on the subject. This idea motivated a painting that I did, and in it you can see Eve is offering the fruit to Adam, and I think that that is significant. It's kind of sacramental. Now, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland, in a BYU speech called Of Souls, Symbols, and Sacraments, kind of broadened our view of what a sacrament is. And what I see in this situation, I wonder if it wasn't even Adam's right to partake of the fruit himself. In none of the accounts that we have, does Adam reach up and partake of the fruit? Partaking of the fruit represents two things. One, the ability to have knowledge in order to utilize agency in the mortal realm, and two, to become mortal and be able to die. That seems to me to be a sacrament that every person in the world has to receive at the hand of a woman. Even Jesus Christ himself could not come into the world except through woman to receive those sacraments of mortality and to be able to use your agency in mortality, and all that comes with that. So I find it very compelling that this moment in the tree, Adam receives the fruit from her hand, and that the choice is his. And we'll talk more about the choice, what he's choosing, coming up. But I'm just really compelled by the kind of sacramental moment that's there. We'll put a link in the description for that Elder Holland talk if you're interested in his thoughts on soul symbols and sacraments. But the question often comes up, why is there a need for a transgression of the law? Elder Dallin H. Oaks, 
in, let's call it a landmark talk that he gave at the General Conference in October of 1993 called The Great Plan of Happiness. And we're going to quote that multiple times. He says, for reasons that have not been revealed, this transition or fall could not happen without a transgression. An exercise of moral agency amounting to a willful breaking of a law, this would be a planned offense, a formality to serve an eternal purpose. And I'm not sure that we could say much more than that. True. And yes, as Jay pointed out, this is a particularly good talk from Elder Oaks regarding the fall of Adam and the plan of salvation. The Pearl of Great Price Student Institute Manual includes these additional insights from this talk. First, a discussion of sin versus transgression. He says, quote, The contrast between a sin and a transgression reminds us of the careful wording in the second article of faith. We believe that men will be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's transgression. It also echoes a familiar distinction in the law. Some acts, like murder, are crimes because they are inherently wrong. Other acts, like operating without a license, are crimes only because they are legally prohibited. Under these distinctions, the act that produced the fall was not a sin, inherently wrong, but a transgression, wrong because it was formally prohibited. These words are not always used to denote something different, but this distinction seems meaningful in the circumstances of the fall, end quote. But Elder Oaks goes on to discuss, quote, It was Eve who first transgressed the limits of Eden in order to initiate the conditions of mortality. Her act, whatever its nature, was formally a transgression, but eternally a glorious necessity to open the doorway toward eternal life. Adam showed his wisdom by doing the same. And thus Eve and Adam fell that men might be. Some Christians condemn Eve for her act, concluding that she and her daughters are somehow flawed by it. Not the Latter-day Saints. Informed by Revelation, we celebrate Eve's act and honor her wisdom and courage in the great episode called The Fall. Brigham Young declared, We should never blame Mother Eve, not the least. Elder Joseph Fielding Smith said, I never speak of the part Eve took in this fall as a sin, nor do I accuse Adam of a sin. This was a transgression of the law, but not a sin, for it was something that Adam and Eve had to do. End quote. So in the Pearl of Great Price Institute student manual, it mentions that another meaning of the word transgress is to go beyond established limits or conditions. Adam and Eve went beyond the limits that would have kept them in the Garden of Eden forever, and in so doing, helped provide the opportunity of mortality for all of us. There's probably no better commentary on the doctrinal insights of the Garden of Eden experience than in 2 Nephi chapter 2. So that might be a great resource for study as you study these chapters. So, going back to Moses chapter 4 in verse 13, And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they had been naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, a note on the term nakedness. There can be a distinction between nudity and nakedness. To be nude is a declaration of condition. You are not wearing any clothes. But nakedness is something that is socially devised. For example, different cultures may consider different levels of clothing or types of clothing as to whether you are naked or not. And even in our culture, it can be conditional. It might be appropriate to wear a swimming suit at the pool, but it might be inappropriate to wear it in sacrament meeting. So the way that you look at nakedness is a sense that someone's eyes are upon you and that you are in the wrong condition in the social expectation. It usually follows with shaming in order to help you conform to social expectations. But there's a sense of being aware. 
Now, there's other meanings to that as well. As a matter of fact, the idea of nakedness can be associated with shame throughout the Old Testament and usually has to do with righteousness or unrighteousness. The idea that they used fig leaves to make clothing to cover their nakedness is interesting because of what happens next. Let's take a look at verse 14. And they heard the voice of the Lord God as they were walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife went to hide themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And that's where I wanted to connect us with verse 13. If they are dressing using leaves of the fig tree, and then they're hiding amongst the trees, perhaps also fig trees, you get this idea that they are trying to camouflage themselves. In other words, when we sin and fall short of God's expectations for us, we feel ashamed. And one way that we might act is to want to dress like the world and then to fit into the world so we can hide from the presence of God because we feel like he doesn't want us anymore. He couldn't want us. And therefore, we will hide ourselves. And you may have observed this kind of thing even amongst young people at church, and maybe this was you, that when you begin making choices, but you still are at church, you may start dressing differently to show that, look, I'm separating myself from you. I'm not like you. I'm going to dress like the world. I want to fit in with the world. And maybe it's open rebellion, but maybe it's just feeling ashamed of decisions that we've made, not properly understanding the gospel of Jesus Christ and the atonement. So God's going to teach that to them. And we'll talk more about the concept of hiding from God here in verse 15. And I, the Lord God, called unto Adam and said unto him, Where goest thou? Now, quick note on this. The Lord's question, where goest thou? Moses gives us a much clearer insight here. Genesis 3 verse 9 tells us that the Lord asks, where art thou? Some still might be confused by the fact that the Lord asks a question. Does this mean that Adam actually successfully hid himself from the Lord? Remember the relationship here. Have you ever played peekaboo with a little toddler? Where's the baby, you taunt. But you know where the baby is. In many cases, you're actively holding them. The Lord asks probing questions not to gain knowledge for himself, but to teach Adam, to help Adam analyze his own situation. Remember what Alma the Younger taught his son Corianton in Alma chapter 39, verse 8. Ye cannot hide your crimes from God, and except ye repent, they will stand as a testimony against you at the last day. And so to Adam, God asks, Where goest thou? Verse 16, And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I beheld that I was naked, and I hid myself. And I, the Lord God, said unto Adam, Who told thee thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? If so, thou shouldst surely die? And the man said, The woman thou gavest me, and commanded that she should remain with me. She gave me of the fruit of the tree." And I did eat. Now, this verse, first of all, I love the addition in Moses. And commandest that she should remain with me. To me, that's the key of understanding the intention. Because often in many commentaries, people say, oh, there's Adam. He's throwing the woman under the bus. I don't see it that way. And maybe maybe that is correct. But let me offer this, especially with that commandest that she should remain with me. And I'm speaking here as a husband. The woman thou gavest me, and here we're referring to the marriage relationship. Adam here is telling the truth. He's not lying to God. And so he's saying what happened. But he's reminding God, as if he would need to, not to separate them. The woman who thou gavest me, and commandest that she should remain with me. Remember that. Whatever's about to happen, remember we're supposed to be together. You made a commandment that she should remain with me. If I'm going to be cast out or die or whatever, let us at least be together. That's how I see it. As a husband, that would be my intention. Whatever's going to happen because of our decisions, don't separate us. So just something to think about from a husband's perspective. Nice. Going back to the chapter, verse 19, 
And I, the Lord God, said unto the woman, What is this thing which thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And I, the Lord God, said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou shalt be cursed above all cattle, and every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. And he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. You know, there's different translations for this piece at the end of the verse about the bruising of the head and the bruising of the heel. In some places, we even have that notion that the man shall crush the serpent's head. What I think is compelling about that idea is that there's a difference between the head and the heel. Often, poetically, we refer to the feet as that thing that's doing action. So Satan's influence may be to bruise or to strike at the actions, but our head is still ours. As a matter of fact, the head of the serpent, which would be his primary intentions, is something that we have the ability to have power over because of this enmity. So it's an interesting distinction between the head and the heel there. Hmm. Going back to the chapter, verse 22. Unto the woman I, the Lord God, said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, let's explore a little bit in verse 22. The Perlu Great Price student manual offers this. It says the Hebrew word for multiply is rabah, meaning to repeat over and over. It does not suggest greater sorrow, but rather repeated sorrow. The Hebrew word for sorrow in the Genesis account of chapter 3, verse 16, is from otzab, which means labor or pain. While these words suggest that toil and suffering would be part of Eve's life, Eve did not view the conditions that came upon her through the fall to be a curse. And we're going to talk about that when we get into chapter 5. Moses, chapter 4, verse 22, quote, is a great revelation to women. Eve and her daughters can become co-creators with God by preparing bodies for his spirit children to occupy on earth and later in eternity. Mothering would entail inconvenience, suffering, travail, and sorrow. These the Lord foretold as natural consequences and not as a curse. Close quote. And that's referencing the Rasmussen Latter-day Saint commentary. Now, the last part of the verse illustrates how complicated translation is. There is much debate about what is the best way to translate these words. If you're interested in an excellent discussion on the topic, we'll put a link in the description. This particular article features a review of a 2016 paper by Andrew McIntosh, one of the world's leading scholars of biblical Hebrew. In place of desire, he would use, your devotion will be toward your husband. Interesting. Also, in an article by Rabbi Daniel Lappin, he translates the word desire in the King James Version, or devotion, into attraction, and then expounds on the last part of the verse. God speaking to Cain, and it, sin, will be attracted to you, but you will be able to control it. Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. God speaking to Eve, and you will be attracted to your man who will be able to control you. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. The Hebrew word I have translated as control is mashal, poorly translated in the King James and many subsequent translations as rule. The Hebrew word meaning rule, to dominate by power, is shalat, from Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 9, there is a time when one man rules, shalat, over another to his own pain. The reference here is to one man exerting sheer power over another. However, mashal means influencing and even controlling another by spiritual forces. When I make a significant charitable donation because my friends around me are doing so, I have been influenced by the magic of Mashal, not Shalat. 
I was neither forced nor subjected to a ruling by someone with power over me. When God addressed Cain in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, using the word mashal, clearly Cain is not able to rule over sin or suppress it by force or a powerful decree. He can only overcome it with spiritual strength. The word mashal has the same meaning when God speaks to Eve. He advises her that she would feel almost irresistibly drawn to a man with the ability to control her through his spiritual strength of willpower, determination, and ambition. She would feel little attraction for a weak man incapable of controlling her. Instead, if involved socially or romantically with such a man, she would end up controlling him to the ultimate unhappiness of both. End quote. If you're interested in the full article, we'll put the link in the description. Now, for all of the translations and complexity that's involved in that, let's just get a simple declaration by President Gordon B. Hinckley from a general conference in October of 1991. He says, My own interpretation of that sentence is that the husband shall have a governing responsibility to provide for, to protect, to strengthen, and shield the wife. Let's go on in verse 23. And unto Adam, I, the Lord God, said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the fruit of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed shall be the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Remember how we talked about sorrow, meaning labor. So in effort, you will eat of it all the days of thy life. Verse 24. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. By the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, until thou shalt return unto the ground, for thou shalt surely die. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou wast, and unto dust shalt thou return. Did you notice that there is no curse here for Adam or Eve? The only one that gets cursed is is the serpent. Adam and Eve are given kind of a heads up. In other words, because of what you've done and this transformation, life will be different now. Here's what you will expect. Right. A lot of times we may read these verses as a form of punishment. Because you did what I told you not to do, I'm going to make your lives miserable. But perhaps look at this instead as loving instruction. Think about the idea of sending an adult child into the world to live on his or her own. You may sit down with them and explain, you're used to food always being in the kitchen and the electric bill always being paid. That's not going to happen for you anymore. The Lord is explaining to Adam and Eve that conditions were ideal, but because you made this choice, the correct choice, by the way, the world is mortal now and so are you. Here's how this world works. There will be weeds. You have to work to get food, and eventually you will die. The Pearl of Great Price Institute Manual has this additional quote from Elder L. Whitney Clayton from October 2009 General Conference. He says, quote, Adam was told, Cursed shall be the ground for thy sake, which meant for his benefit, and by the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Work is a continual burden, but it is also a continual blessing for our sake, for it teaches lessons which we can learn only by the sweat of our face. End quote. That is a really good point. Let's go on to verse 26. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. For thus have I, the Lord God, called the first of all women, which are many. Sister Sherry L. Dew, former counselor to the General Relief Society president, pointed out in the October 2001 General Conference, quote, of all the words they could have chosen to define her role and her essence, both God the Father and Adam called Eve the mother of all living. And they did so before she ever bore a child. Close quote. Going on in verse 27. Unto Adam and also unto his wife did I, the Lord God, make coats of skins 
and clothed them. Now, they already had clothes. They made aprons out of fig leaves. But notice here that God rejects the relationship proposed by the clothing created by Adam and Eve. Remember that the fig leaves, with those, they attempted to camouflage themselves in the trees to hide themselves from God. Often this clothing represents something about our covenantal relationship. So instead, the clothing created by God was by the shedding of innocent blood. As far as we know, the first death in the world. And it was to remind them constantly that he wants them back in his presence. And it doesn't say what animal was sacrificed in order to create the coat of skins. But I don't think it was a rhinoceros. Probably not. It would certainly be incredibly profound if it was a lamb. That, too, would remind them of this symbolism, and that would tie into the commandment that they'll be given later in the next chapter. Well, and from a possibly pragmatic perspective, it's possible that the coats of skin were much more comfortable than wearing leaves. (laughs) That could also be. Verses 28 through 32, Adam and Eve were driven out of the Garden of Eden, and God placed cherubim and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now, cherubim is actually the plural of cherub. In Hebrew, you make a word plural by adding im, I am, just like the way that we add s in English. From the Bible Dictionary, we read that cherubim are figures representing heavenly creatures, the exact form being unknown. They are found in the Holy of Holies, on the mercy seat of the ark, and in the visions of Ezekiel. In the account of the fall, cherubim are represented as keeping the way of the tree of life. And that's all we know about that. That's right. Well, let's take a look now at Moses chapter 5. The first 11 verses are not found in Genesis and are essential for understanding the outcome of the Garden of Eden story. So let's start in verse 1. And it came to pass that after I, the Lord God, had driven them out, that Adam began to till the earth and to have dominion over all the beasts of the field, and to eat his bread by the sweat of his brow, as I the Lord had commanded him. And Eve also, his wife, did labor with him. And Adam knew his wife, and she bare unto him sons and daughters, and they began to multiply and replenish the earth. Now isn't that a vision? Adam and Eve did just what the Lord commanded. They labored and they multiplied. Can you see them in your mind's eye, working and laboring together? It's a beautiful image. In verses 4 and 5, Adam and Eve call upon God, and he gives them commandments, and Adam was obedient. They were to worship the Lord their God and should offer the firstlings of their flocks. So this is the beginning of animal sacrifice. In verse 6, And after many days an angel of the Lord appeared unto Adam, saying, Why dost thou offer sacrifices unto the Lord? And Adam said unto him, I know not, save the Lord commanded me. And then the angel spake, saying, This thing is a similitude of the sacrifice of the only begotten of the Father, which is full of grace and truth. Wherefore thou shalt do all that thou doest in the name of the Son, and thou shalt repent and call upon God in the name of the Son forevermore. And in that day, The Holy Ghost fell upon Adam, which beareth record of the Father and the Son, saying, I am the only begotten of the Father from the beginning, henceforth and forever, that as thou hast fallen, thou mayest be redeemed, and all mankind, even as many as will. You know, there's some really incredible things that we learn from Adam here. First of all, obedience comes first. And often will lead to understanding later. We seem to want the understanding first before we're obedient. But obedience helps us to be prepared to understand why we're doing what we're doing. And obedience also demonstrates faith. Yeah. You are trusting that the Lord's commandments are given for a purpose. And you don't know what that purpose is yet, but you trust that there is a purpose and you move forward. Yeah. And there's many examples of that. Notice something else in verse 9, something significant about the Holy Ghost. He is speaking here as the Son. 
God has such confidence in his servants that he considers their inspired words as his own. This principle is called divine investiture of authority. We saw this in Moses 1 when Jesus spoke to Moses as the Father. And even in the Lord's words to Moses in verse 25 of chapter 1, they shall obey thy command as if thou wert God. So, divine investiture of authority. We sometimes get obsessive about who's speaking. Is it God or is it Jesus? Is it the Holy Ghost? It really doesn't matter. They all speak as one. Absolutely. And to further clarify on that concept of divine investiture of authority, from teachings of presidents of the church, Joseph Fielding Smith, it says, quote, The Father placed his name upon the Son, and Jesus Christ spoke and ministered in and through the Father's name. And so far as power, authority, and godship are concerned, his words and acts were and are those of the Father, end quote. Great point. Coming up now in verses 10 and 11, we have songs of praise. So if you weren't sure how Adam and Eve were feeling about things in the garden and what happened, here is how they feel in verse 10. And in that day, Adam blessed God and was filled and began to prophesy concerning all the families of the earth, saying, Blessed be the name of God. For because of my transgression, my eyes are opened, and in this life I shall have joy, and again in the flesh I shall see God. And then in verse 11 is Eve's song of praise. And Eve, his wife, heard all these things and was glad, saying, Were it not for our transgression, we never should have had seed, and never should have known good and evil. And the joy of our redemption, and the eternal life, which God giveth unto all the obedient. Going back to that article that we were referencing from Elder Oaks from October 1993 General Conference called The Great Plan of Happiness, he says, quote, Modern revelation shows that our first parents understood the necessity of the fall. Adam declared, Blessed be the name of God, for because of my transgression, my eyes are opened. And in this life I shall have joy, and again in the flesh I shall see God. Note the different perspective and the special wisdom of Eve, who focused on the purpose and effect of the great plan of happiness. Were it not for our transgression, we never should have had seed, and never should have known good and evil, and the joy of our redemption, and the eternal life which God giveth unto all the obedient. End quote. Going on in verse 12, and Adam and Eve blessed the name of God, and they made all things known unto their sons and their daughters. Now look at verse 13. Now we've got revenge. Satan has been thwarted in the garden. But now in verse 13, And Satan came among them, saying, I am also a son of God. And he commanded them, saying, Believe it not. And they believed it not. And they loved Satan more than God. And men began from that time forth to be carnal, sensual, and devilish. So why was that so easy for Satan? Believe it not, and they believed it not. Remember that faith is a choice between a compelling reason to believe and a compelling reason not to believe. What direction we go says something about who we want to become. So they were presented with two options. The doctrine of God is proposed by Adam and Eve and Satan and his doctrine. What they chose and how easily they chose it said something about who they wanted to become. And that's part of human nature, isn't it? Yeah. Why was Satan so successful? Because what our Father in Heaven asked us to do, asked Adam and Eve and his children to do, was hard. Satan comes along and says, well, don't do that. Just do whatever you feel like doing. Well, that's easier. That's a lot nicer to do. Now, it has terrible consequences. Those will come later. And you certainly won't progress. But that's that struggle. Why is Satan so successful? Because mortality is hard. Disciplining our bodies is hard. Becoming like our Father in Heaven is hard. But so worth it. Absolutely. So, verse 14, And the Lord God called upon men by the Holy Ghost everywhere, and commanded them, 
that they should repent. Going on in verse 15, And as many as believed in the Son and repented of their sins should be saved, and as many as believed not and repented not should be damned. And the words went forth out of the mouth of God in a firm decree, wherefore they must be fulfilled. Now the rest of the chapter provides examples of individuals who listened to the Lord and others who did not listen and refused to repent of their sins. Let's take a look in verse 16. And Adam and Eve his wife ceased not to call upon God. And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord, wherefore he may not reject his words. But behold, Cain hearkened not, saying, Who is the Lord that I should know him? And she again conceived and bare his brother Abel, and Abel hearkened unto the voice of the Lord. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And Cain loved Satan more than God. And Satan commanded him, saying, Make an offering unto the Lord. Now, do you notice the problem right away? Who is commanding him to make an offering unto the Lord? It's not just what we do. It's the attentions behind what we do. Whose commandments are we following? So here, it's Satan. Now, that may remind you of a story later in the Old Testament of the prophet Samuel. In 1 Samuel 15, King Saul took it upon himself without authority to perform a sacrifice. And Samuel explained in verse 22, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. In other words, what is Cain's problem here? It's not that he made an offering unto the Lord. That's a good thing. But who was he obeying to do it? Yeah, that is key. Let's go on to verse 19. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. Now Satan knew this, and it pleased him. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. From teachings of presidents of the church, Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith tells us, quote, Salvation could not come into the world without the mediation of Jesus Christ. By faith in this atonement or plan of redemption, Abel offered to God a sacrifice that was accepted, which was the firstlings of the flock. Cain offered of the fruit of the ground and was not accepted because he could not do it in faith. He could not exercise faith contrary to the plan of heaven. As the sacrifice was instituted for a type by which man was to discern the great sacrifice which God had prepared to offer a sacrifice contrary to that, no faith could be exercised. End quote. Excellent point. Going on in verse 22, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, thou shalt be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and Satan desireth to have thee. And except thou shalt hearken unto my commandments, I will deliver thee up, and it shall be unto thee according to his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Notice that the word desire here is the same one that we talked about earlier regarding Eve to her husband. In this instance, Satan seems like he will become the bride to Cain. Where is he making his covenants? Verse 24, For from this time forth thou shalt be the father of his lies. Thou shalt be called perdition, for thou wast also before the world. And it shall be said in time to come that these abominations were had from Cain, for he rejected the greater counsel which was had from God. And this is a cursing which I will put upon thee, except thou repent. Notice that Adam accepted God and the obligations and blessings set for him, and there were blessings as a result. We saw his praises. Cain is being warned what the alternative is for him if he follows this path. Now, we've talked about perdition before, but I want to point out something here. 
Simply disobeying God's commandments does not make you a son of perdition. Notice who Cain is having this conversation with. He knows there is a greater knowledge here implied. He knows it, and he is willingly rejecting it. That is perdition. Going back to the chapter, verse 26, And Cain was wroth, and listened not any more to the voice of the Lord, neither to Abel his brother, who walked in holiness before the Lord. And Adam and his wife mourned before the Lord because of Cain and his brethren. And it came to pass that Cain took one of his brother's daughters to wife, and they loved Satan more than God. And Satan said unto Cain, Swear unto me by thy throat, and if thou tell it, thou shalt die, and swear thy brethren by their heads, and by the living God that they tell it not. For if they tell it, they shall surely die, and this that thy father may not know it. And this day I will deliver thy brother Abel into thine hands. And Satan sware unto Cain that he would do according to his commands. And all these things were done in secret. And Cain said, Truly I am Mahan, the master of this great secret, that I may murder and get gain. Wherefore Cain was called Master Mahan, and he gloried in his wickedness. Now, you may notice that we are creating here, especially if you've read the Book of Mormon, this is a secret combination. And I wonder if this is what's being referenced among the Jaredites. If we were to go to Ether chapter 8, one of the Jaredite kings who took possession of the kingdom by power, the kingdom was taken back and he was sorrowful because of the loss of his kingdom. This was King Jared. And the daughter of Jared encourages her father to read the record of their fathers in verse 9. She says, Behold, is there not an account concerning them of old, that they by their secret plans did obtain kingdoms and great glory? You see this reference. She wants him to read the scriptures. Why? So that she can learn about perhaps Cain, I think is what is being referred to here, so that her father can learn about these secret plans. So I mean, it's just the opposite of what we would normally want to read the scriptures for, but it seems to be a reference to this when secret combinations were first created. So let's see what happens next. Verse 32, And Cain went into the field, and Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass that while they were in the field, Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And Cain gloried in that which he had done, saying, I am free. Surely the flocks of my brother falleth into my hands. Now, just an aside here. There's a couple of interesting things just in that verse. Number one, the phrase, I am free. There's a great irony to that phrase. It's just like anything else in this life. When we are working hard to discipline our bodies and to follow the commandments of the Lord, yes, you're free from that burden of having to try hard, but now you've lost everything. And as a matter of fact, you've put yourself into bondage to your body. Surely the flocks of my brother falleth into my hands. So it almost implies that this was also about getting gain. His brother had flocks, and now they're his flocks. Back to the chapter, verse 34. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. And now thou shalt be cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, Satan tempted me because of my brother's flocks, and I was wroth also for his offering thou didst accept and not mine. My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the Lord, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that he that findeth me will slay me because of mine iniquities. For these things are not hid from the Lord. And I, the Lord, said unto him, Whosoever slayeth thee, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And I, the Lord, set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. And Cain was shut out from the presence of the Lord 
and with his wife and many of his brethren dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. Do you notice, if you were to just read this and think about what happened with Adam and Eve being shut out from the presence of the Lord, and then you see that they are obedient and prosperous and all had to do with their attitude. Cain is a whole different experience and yet kind of parallels what happened to Adam and Eve. And yet his desires were completely different. The Pearl of Great Price Institute student manual offers this insight. It says, it must be noted that the mark that was set upon Cain was not the same thing as the curse that he received. The mark was to distinguish him as the one who had been cursed by the Lord. It was placed upon Cain so that no one finding him would kill him. The Institute Manual also says this, Part of the curse Cain received for killing Abel was that the ground would no longer yield unto Cain her strength, and that he would be a fugitive and a vagabond. A fugitive is a person who is running from the law, and a vagabond is someone who has no home. Cain was also driven out from the face of the Lord. The prophet Joseph Smith said, The power, glory, and blessings of the priesthood could not continue with those who received ordination only as their righteousness continued. For Cain also being authorized to offer sacrifice, but not offering it in righteousness, was cursed. It signifies then that the ordinances must be kept in the very way God has appointed, Otherwise, their priesthood will prove a cursing instead of a blessing. Now, in the upcoming verses, verses 42 through 54, some of Cain's descendants also chose wickedness and would not hearken to the Lord. They likewise suffered the consequences of their sins. I just want to make clear that the church manuals are very consistent on this, that we are not to speculate about the mark or the curse placed upon Cain or upon some of his descendants. Note that Cain's son Enoch in verses 42 and 43 is not the righteous Enoch that we will introduce later. Also in verses 47 through 52, I find this really interesting. There's a person named Lamech who tells his wives about these secret combinations from the days of Cain involving the oath or an oath. When Lamech killed, it was not as Cain who killed to get gain but he killed to protect the oath of secrecy. Those secret covenants of Satan were just had among men, he points out, because Lamech had told them unto his wives, and check this out, in verses 53 and 54 it says, they rebelled against him and declared these things abroad and had not compassion. Wherefore Lamech was despised and cast out. I always find it interesting that here we've got all these secret oaths for killing and he happens to tell his wives and they're like, uh, no, it doesn't indicate they're particularly righteous people, but they definitely were not having any of these oaths and they told everybody. And so Lamech was despised. Well, let's go back to Moses chapter five, verse 55. And thus the works of darkness began to prevail among all the sons of men. And God cursed the earth with a sore curse and was angry with the wicked with all the sons of men whom he had made. For they would not hearken unto his voice, nor believe his only begotten Son, even him whom he declared should come in the meridian of time, who was prepared from before the foundation of the world. And thus the gospel began to be preached from the beginning, being declared by holy angels sent forth from the presence of God, and by his own voice, and by the gift of the Holy Ghost. And thus all things were confirmed unto Adam by an holy ordinance, and the gospel preached, and a decree sent forth, that it should be in the world until the end thereof. And thus it was. Amen. Well, there it is, chapters 4 and 5 of Moses. Every day we encounter voices or influences that prompt us to do good and others that entice us toward temptation and sin. The principles we identified during this lesson can help us choose to hearken to righteous voices and influences that will bless us. Apply what we have learned. What stood out to you today? What did the Spirit touch your heart with? Engage in holy ordinances and open yourselves up to the gospel, which is declared by holy angels sent forth from the presence of God. 
There's one other thought that I'd like to leave you with in regards to families. Sometimes we have problems within our own families. Sometimes we have struggles. Sometimes we have those who are disobedient or making poor choices. This can get discouraging, and we as human beings tend to compare our worst with someone else's best, and that's not fair. For those who might be feeling discouraged about having maybe what some would call a dysfunctional family, remember that since the mortal world began, Adam and Eve themselves, the very first parents, had a son that killed his brother. Life is hard. Families can be hard, but just like anything else in the plan of salvation, working at it is so worth it. Just don't do it by yourself. Remember that we are to go through this life and all its challenges yoked to Jesus Christ. It's through him that we have the power and the strength through his grace to do what needs to be done. Absolutely. Well, this has been a great lesson. We encourage you to continue reading your scriptures and discussing them with your friends and family. And we'll look forward to talking to you more about them in our next lesson. We'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But we're really big fans. <laughs>